Okay, so thank you everyone and welcome back to our se second session on the impact of COVID-19 in the camps. The session would be moderated by Professor Amina Mohsin, who teaches in the Department of International Relations at the University of Dhaka. She graduated from the same department and later received her MA from the University of Hawaii, USA, and her PhD from Cambridge University, UK. Professor Amena has received numerous awards and fellowships. She works on gender and minority, state and democracy, borders and human security, and her work on the Chittagong Hill Track conflict is really prominent and also other books and works are well admired worldwide. And she is a very well-known well scholar and yeah, a public speaker and probably everyone knows her in Bangladesh and in South Asia. And also she has extensive global exposure. So I would welcome Professor Amena Mohsin to start moderating the session. And please, uh, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Bias, for your very kind words. Well, let, let me welcome all to the first working session of the two-day international conference on Rohingya on the crisis on the Rohingya crisis in comparative perspective. Well, the, this year, I mean, August 2020 marked the third year uh, since the latest influx of the Rohingyas into Bangladesh. And uh, in this context, it needs to be pointed out that Bangladesh being the eighth most populous country in the world with the population density of 1265 persons per square kilometer, is hosting the largest refugee camp in the Caucasus Bazaar. If one looks into the demographic of the composition of the refugee population, and it is like this, that 52% of, the, of uh, the total population is women and girls, and uh, then 55% are children, 42% adults, and 3% are elderly population. Uh, this, this coronavirus, uh, it, uh, I mean, the refugee problem itself was, is a major crisis, as the earlier speakers had pointed out for Bangladesh, and the coronavirus added to it only. And there are several reasons for it. Uh, first, uh, one would want, I, I would like to point out the congested nature of the camps itself, you know, camps themselves, that they are so congested. And then the contagious nature of the virus itself, I mean, that itself created a problem and a fear, not only among the Rohingya population, but also among the host community that it might just spread, you know, and the host, there were, there were uh, major voices of concerns and rightfully so from the host community and also from the refugees themselves. And then the stigmatization that, was, that is attached to the virus itself, uh, particularly during the initial period. Uh, so, you know, these are the different issues that compounded together to create a very complex kind of a problem. But uh, I'm happy to say that the Bangladesh government, along with the assistance of uh, uh, some INGOs and NGOs, moved forward to, and we did manage to uh, uh, tackle the problem, I would say, in a relatively peaceful manner. In this uh, panel, we have four very distinguished scholars, I must say very distinguished, not only in Bangladesh, but also abroad. And uh, uh, they have been working with the Rohingya problem or the Rohingya crisis since its inception. In fact, uh, to my knowledge, some of them have been working on these issues even before this crisis evolved. I mean, on, on, uh, on the mig migrants and the refugee issues, I mean, they, they have their expertise. And uh, they'll be speaking uh, based on their own research and on their own experiences. And uh, the first two presentations, these are uh, based uh, 
on the institutional or the structural aspects or dimension of the problem. And the later two presentations would cover up uh, the happenings or what is going on uh, in and around the camps, if I may say so. Our first uh, presenter or first presentation is by Dr. A.K.M. Taifur Rahman. Uh, Taifur Rahman is a public health expert. He is the executive director of Health Management Bangladesh Foundation and uh, adjunct faculty, Department of uh, Public Health, North South University uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, he, he'll be speaking, he'll be making a presentation on health issues and the, the Rohingya refugees during the COVID-19 pandemic. Typhoon, it is all yours and you have 20 min uh, 10 minutes. So. Uh, uh, thank you, madam. Thank you. Mm, and thank you for uh, give, um, giving me this chance. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bayas Ahmed Bhai uh, and his team of UCL and uh, distinguished guest uh, welcome to my presentation i am trying to share my screen mm. yes so uh, my today's uh, title is health issues among the rohingya refugees during pandemic Actually, uh, I would like to say that we are working, uh, HMBD Foundation is working in the Rohingya refugee camp last, last three years. Um, actually, just after the inception of the crisis, uh, we are working there since September 2017. And uh, from uh, since then to till now, we have treated almost uh, 150,000 Rohingya patients in our clinic. <clears throat> Besides this, we are uh, working on education, wash, shelter in other sectors. And, and uh, yes, sorry. And uh, since August 20, uh, 25, 2017, more than 700,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar have fled to Bangladesh. Today, about 860,000 stateless Rohingya refugees live in the world's largest and most densely populated refugee camp at Ukhia and Teknaf of Cox's Bazar. With the emergence of COVID-19 global pandemic, this population is particularly vulnerable to the serious public health threat. And uh, this is at a glance about the health issues uh, for the Rohingya. Uh, COVID-19 cases in Rohingya camps until 29th November, first confirmed case in refugee camp on 5th May, 15th May, 2020. Number of tests, 18,421. And confirmed case, 356. Out of them, male and female ratio is 50% and 50% as I uh, uh, as I uh, heard from the health sector, Cox's budget, and total death is 10, male 4, female 6. Recovered three, uh, 311 and qu in quarantine 1,174, isolation 42. And lead organization who are working uh, for this COVID crisis, they are uh, uh, UNHCR, Refugee International, uh, MTI, MTI is Medical, Medical Teams International, International Organization for Migration, UNICEF, ICDDRB, uh, International Rescue Committee, MSF, <clears throat> International Federation of Red Cross, and others. And right now, available facilities in the Rohingya camp. There are uh, for, for the COVID patients, especially, there is field hospital, then health post, then See, uh, severe acute respiratory infection unit, then uh, um, then isolation treatment center, diarrhea treatment center, and primary healthcare center. 
and uh, here you can uh, see the uh, overview of total uh, isolation unit and severe acute respiratory infection and infection treatment center facilities in the refugee camp. Uh, isolation unit total active bed uh, 114 uh, and uh, standby bed 0, planned bed is 50, total 164, active severe acute respiratory infection bed 194, standby severe acute respiratory infection bed 60, planned 800, so total uh, 1054. Total current severe acute respiratory infection, infection treatment control bed occupied 82, virus capacity is 785. Total quarantine occupied 55, virus uh, capacity 100, uh, 1635. And if you see the um, map uh, in Pukhi and Teknap of Coxes, you can see. Uh, uh, all, uh, there are a lot of uh, isolation center and infection treatment facilities uh, in different part of the refugee camp. And rapid investigation and response team for COVID-19 for FDMN, BRAC, uh, ACTATE, DRC, DRC is Danish Refugee Council, Refugee International, Medical Teams International and International Organization for Migration Care, they, uh, they are uh, organizing rapid investigation response team. And Sentinel case testing uh, yeah, unit, total nine facilities and total 61 bed capacity are there. And IOM, MSF and Service Civil International, they are organizing this nine Sentinel sentinels, uh, testing center. And uh, here is the referral pathway of general patient. Like uh, I think we all of know all know that uh, standard case definition of suspected case of COVID-19. Uh, like uh, I want to uh, say uh, in short, a patient with any acute respiratory illness and having been in contact with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case in the 14 days prior to onset of symptom or a patient with acute respiratory illness or a patient with severe acute respiratory infection. And the referral pathway is uh, patient, uh, you know, patient visited to help uh, with the symptom, patient visited to help post primary healthcare center and field hospital. And screening after the screening, if this uh, from the cell, uh, health and facilities, they uh, suspected any sort of symptom uh, they immediately arrange mask and isolate the patient until transfer, call IOM disperse and referral unit, line list, CIC camp in charge notified, suspected cases, start risk supportive management if required, transfer to appropriate isolation and treatment facility. And after that, trials upon arrival, disinfection, uh, the vehicle start clinical management, call yards take lab specimen, line listing, psychological care. And uh, there are IOM, uh, IOM manage this, uh, uh, this co coordinate the whole thing. Beside emergency, UARTS is emergency warning and response system. They, uh, they also uh, manage the thing, they coordinate the uh, site management and um, they, uh, from the site management team, they, ar they arrange one coordinator uh, one team member to <clears throat> contact tracing the patient around his uh, house. And rapid investigation team, if tested is positive, continue to clinical management, refer if required to Minister of Health Isolation Center, discharge after two negative tests. And if negative, discharge and refer to general hospital if symptom is persist. And here is another pathway for the obstetric patient, if patient ID identified in the uh, health post or field hospital, primary health care center, uh, pregnant in labor or postpartum patient, mask and place isolation and holding area, manage emergency care in maternal region, and uh, IOM dispatch and referral, uh, informed IOM dispatch referral unit. If comprehensive emergency obstructive and newborn ca uh, care, then infection treatment center, Hope Field Hospital in Camp 4. 
and if uh, bemoan that is basic emergency obstetric and newborn care sent to UNHCR, MSF, IRC, Hope, and Save the Children, IOM, uh, these facilities. And uh, uh, patient uh, identified the COVID like symptom, known COVID positive patient visited to uh, a home by community health worker and home based care team. And actually, I want to say uh, in the refugee camp, the COVID situation, COVID management, and isolation center, infection treatment facility. These are, uh, uh, this is my, uh, my observation. This is better from, even from Dhaka. Even from Dhaka in Rohingya camp isolation center, they maintain the, the international standard uh, with, uh, with full uh, health team. In Dhaka, in, uh, uh, in, uh, I have uh, the chance, the opportunity to visit a lot of big hospitals, some of the big hospitals in Dhaka. Uh, they have scarcity of doctors, medical teams, scarcity of uh, treatment, um, uh, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. But in Rohingya camp, this infection control center, this isolation center, all are well equipped and, uh, and full team are working there. And in uh, last three years, uh, uh, there are other sort of health uh, services there, like health posts, field hospitals, primary health care center, maternal child health center. And uh, right now, all health care facilities are running their regular activities during this pandemic, maintaining social distance, personal protection, hand washing, screening, vital signs for COVID-19. And another thing, uh, after this February, after this March, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, national and international NGOs are working there and most of their activity was closed. But health, wash, these, uh, these activities are, uh, are going on every day. Uh, so um, uh, though there are lockdown, though there are uh, uh, very bad, there are very bad condition, but uh, national and international and government health team uh, uh, is working there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saiful. Uh, uh, as we have planned, you know, after the presentations, we'll go for a for a Q and A session. Uh, our next speaker is Barrister Sara Hussain. Uh, so Sara is a, a barrister. Who, who is practicing in the Supreme Court, Bangladesh, and mainly in the areas of uh, constitutional, public interest, and family law. Uh, she is the Honorary Executive Director of Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust. She is also a member of the Board of the United Nations uh, Voluntary Funds for Victims of Torture. Apart from this, Sarah is also a public speaker, uh, a, a public commentator, and she has been taking up course, uh, cases on behalf, uh, you know, like public interest cases. And uh, she is an uh, internationally acclaimed uh, uh, jurist, I would say. Uh, Sarah would be speaking on access to justice uh, for the Rohingya community in the camps during COVID-19. Sarah, it is all yours. And if, if you are, thank you, I'm an yeah. I'm just yeah. going to put a screen, sharing the screen. Um, but I'm not sure if I've been made into. How do I need to do that? It doesn't seem to be coming. Um, in the center, uh, on the yeah. bottom central part. Yeah, yeah I, I know the, that. I, I've done that. But then it says who can share only host all panelists. It doesn't seem to come on. Um, no, you can share it. Try it now. Yeah, it's not okay. I'll try it now. No, I have given you the part. Yeah, I think it will work. Yeah, yeah. I think yes, it will yes. Work. it's working. Great. It's working, isn't it? Okay, great. Yes, perfect. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. Um, so I was going to focus my comments on the area that I'm more familiar with, which is in terms of access to justice, and I've sort of drawn examples um, from the experience of Blast in in working in the camps. Um, I think uh, a bit differently from Dr. Thaifur, I wanted to look at what is the pre-COVID and, and hopefully post-COVID, what is the general framework within which 
the issue of access to justice is considered. Um, and, and then to look at what's changed during COVID. Um, for everyone to be aware of is that, of course, our constitutional rights do apply to the Rohingya. The Rohingya are there as refugees. We may not have signed the convention in Bangladesh, the Refugee Convention, but nevertheless, uh, the Rohingya have certain rights under our laws, of course. And under the constitution, they have the right, there are many rights that are applicable to, to every person within Bangladesh, whether or not they're a citizen. And those include the right to life, personal liberty, fair trial, freedom from torture. And very importantly, the, the right to protection of law of every other person for the time being within Bangladesh. So I think that's the first and most important point. The second is, um, I said I'd speak about access to justice, but particularly in the context of um, sexual and gender-based violence. Um, and in that context also, we see that a number of our laws, our national laws do apply also. They don't have any limitation on whether you have to be a citizen to be able to enjoy their protection. So for example, our, our special laws on violence against women or domestic violence or recent laws on child marriage, uh, the Supreme Court's directives around particular actions that need to be taken to ensure protection also apply irrespective of citizenship. And then in, importantly, I think, um, since it's not enough to have laws on paper, one also has to have access to legal advice, legal assistance in the courts and so on. Our government's legal aid program and the law that deals with that also says that it's applicable to any person who is incapable of seeking justice due to destitution and helplessness. So it seems that that also would be uh, at least uh, seems to be uh, something that would be available to the Rohingya. And I think in terms of the, the actual mechanisms and institutions, um, we have a whole lot of formal justice institutions, of course, police stations, prisons, courts, and we have a specialized machinery or architecture for protection in cases of gender-based, sexual and gender-based violence. So we have the police to run victim support centers. We have government hospitals with one-stop crisis centers. We have special tribunals. We have our Supreme Court. But these really are, these are very important for cases of SGBV, but the kind of day-to-day -day justice mechanisms that most people use, I think it's important to recognize both Bangladeshis and Rohingya in this case, are the informal justice mechanisms, community mechanisms, um, going to paralegals for advice, uh, using hotlines, uh, using alternative dispute resolution, whether it's the traditional shalish or whether it's something more structured provided through NGOs and government offices, a more structured law-based uh, dispute resolution process. So what was, it, what was available before COVID and how did it change? In terms of the kind of experience of uh, NGOs, <laughs> NGO legal service providers, BLAST, BRAC and others who are working there, these are some of the kinds of processes that were quite usual before COVID, courtyard meetings, so we're small gatherings of, of people within the community, men and women, sometimes segregated, sometimes together, speaking about what their rights are under the law, what, their, what kinds of services are available to them within the camps also. Um, legal aid camps also, the, this one you can see a picture is being addressed by lawyers from the Cox's Bazaar Bar, Bar Association, speaking with members of the community again about what kinds of services they can provide and how they can be of assistance. So how, how did this change afterwards? Uh, Professor Amina? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear? No, I can't hear. Uh, I think, uh, yes, probably some technical issues on her side. Yeah, should I give her a call? Or we can go to the next speaker then. Uh, should we go move on to the next speaker then? Yes, and then she, when she's back, she can start from the middle of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Asif. Uh, Asif, if you will. No, uh, no Sara uh, is back. Yes, yes, Sara is back. Okay. Do I need to put, I need to put the screen back again, I think, right? Yes, uh, yeah, just yeah. share again. I think, I think it should you. be visible there. 
Okay, and another challenge that was there pre-COVID and is continuing, of course, is the use of, of securitization generally and the issue of surveillance and, and to the extent there is connectivity, how that's used to, again, um, increase surveillance. The other challenge that is a <coughs> major challenge in terms of providing services is communication. Before COVID, there was a kind of one-way barrier, generally restrictions on exit from the camps for, for Rohingya. Post-COVID, there were two-way barriers during lockdown. So you couldn't exit as a, as a Rohingya, but also many service providers, as Dr. Taifa also mentioned, had, were, had to kind of close down operations initially, particularly during the, the lockdown or shutdown period with limited entry. That's changed a lot right now, of course, and there's, there is access certainly for justice providers. Another interesting point is a, a finding from a recent study, an October study um, by ISCG and Oxfam and others, shows that there's also limited access for Rohingya between camps um, and actually the, and more limited access for women than for men. So they can't move between camps, which means again, you know, restricted access in terms of connections with family members and others. Um, yeah. So, so what are some of the changes that we're seeing during COVID? The recent research shows that there has been, as there has been in many parts of the world, and not only in other parts of Bangladesh, an increase in sexual and gender-based violence, particularly the two, phenom the two phenomena or the two forms of um, SGBV that were particularly prevalent in the Rohingya community, domestic violence and child marriage have also um, have also accelerated or increased. Other forms, um, particularly polygamy, false marriages, sham marriages, abandonment of spouses have also continued. And um, even transphobic violence, violence against sex workers, that's also been reported. <coughs> and with the increase in services, with the increase in, sorry, the, the forms of violence and the, the numbers, we are unfortunately also seeing during COVID a restriction on services. As I mentioned before, the lack of connectivity means that while the, the rest of the country and the rest of the world has sort of embraced uh, inter the internet as a form of in expanding services, that hasn't been as possible in the camps. So we don't have what we're seeing elsewhere in the country, the resort to hotlines, phone lines, and, and so on, to give advice, even to conduct a dispute resolution in family matters, to give emergency support, and so on. It's been, it's been challenging and difficult. Mobile, despite the mo and the mobile phone restrictions, for the Rohingya community also mean that, again, we can't use phone lines and internet to give legal education or advice and so on. Um, at the same time, uh, mobile phones are being more increasingly used by um, the, some of the service providers, by paralegals and lawyers than they have been before. So that's a kind of uh, a caveat to that point. Um, initially, we saw a huge limitation in frontline services. So no paralegals for the months of shutdown were able to go in. Um, lawyers were not able to go in. Of course, you know, offices were closed, courts were closed and so on. But what we did see very importantly is um, through UNHCR's good offices, legal, emergency legal services were recognized as critical services and they were able to continue even through the lockdown in, in, to the extent that UNHCR was supporting them. Other, other kinds of legal services supported by other groups were not able to function during that time. At this point, they're all, they're pretty much all back in operation and they are functioning. But the closure of um, movement and the closure and the limits on connectivity and so on meant that all of the awareness campaigns, which are so important because um, in our context, we see that it's not enough just to have justice providers available. There has to be a demand from the community to seek justice. That whole process of creating demand through courtyard meetings, through awareness campaigns, wasn't really available. And one of the other emergency mechanisms for protection uh, shelter homes for women, women and children in serious cases of um, violence. Shelter homes have also been closed, of course, because of the physical distancing requirements. And the courts were closed for the first few months. Now we have local courts are open again and the Supreme Court is open. Um, and of course, virtual courts are also operating in, in the Supreme Court. In terms of just uh, ongoing barriers to justice, um, issues that need to be confronted during COVID and after, we've seen that in the Rohingya camps and amongst the Rohingya community, as with the vast majority of uh, women affected by SGBV in Bangladesh also, those who are seeking justice prefer to go to informal systems. They prefer shalish, they prefer something quick, easy, cheap, um, some, a system they have confidence in which is near them. This creates a lot of paradoxes because certainly for some serious offenses, that is not the appropriate manner through which to try to, try to address these issues, rape, 
uh, serious forms of violence should not be going into a mediation process. And yet there is this tension that people prefer to go there than necessarily to come to the courts. At the same time, we see that when people do approach, women do approach the courts for serious cases of violence. First of all, very few women do. From, from the Bangladesh statistics, we know that less than 2% of women even go to the police in these cases. We know again from Bangladesh studies that um, uh, the, the, ninth, the conviction rate for cases of violence against women is less than 3%, the sort of best recent figure. Um, and that the majority of women who's, who are rape survivors who go to one-stop crisis centers don't then take any legal action afterwards. So that's the overarching context within Bangladesh. And within that, we can't expect anything very different within the Rohingya camps. Now going forward, what, would we, what could we consider? Sorry, my images are a bit hazy, but what I was trying to show here was um, a, a group of um, survivors inside the Rohingya camps, women survivors of violence in a, in a community discussion. I think that's really the, the, the place to look at is how do we strengthen the community's own ability to provide information to others in the community and to connect them to effective services. Um, to make that happen, connectivity is an issue we have to work on. Now that the internet shutdown is no longer there, how do we make the internet, how do we use the internet effectively? How do we use mobile connections effectively? Given Bangladesh is, is so far ahead in terms of our mobile penetration, we have such huge opportunities which we are using in other areas to do a lot of our development work now using mobile platforms and internet platforms. How do we use them in the Rohingya camps to ensure that um, Rohingya women and children and others who face um, gender-based violence have access to hotlines, can get, for example, online legal education now that education is also uh, formally um, uh, recognized by the government as a service that will be provided. Um, so I think that's one area for us to focus on. Another very important one is how to, how to strengthen informal justice mechanisms. Um, and this can be done particularly, I think, through working with community paralegals. Right now, the paralegals are uh, young people from the local community, from Cox's Bazaar in general, in some cases from other districts, working through organizations like BLAS, BRAC, Nari Popko, Madari Legal Aid, many others, Aina Shalish Kendra, and so on. But actually, the community paralegals can be from the Rohingya community themselves. At the moment, many of the Rohingya community can operate as volunteers working with some of these organizations. But if it, if it were possible for them to actually take on these positions formally, that would give them a kind of career pathway and it would provide a critical service within the camps as well. And focusing on mediation and alternative dispute res resolution is the other the other suggestion that we need to focus on. And very finally, um, I think the other area of access that we, we should be looking at going forward is with all of the COVID restrictions in place, how do we get the district legal aid committees, the government legal aid committees to partner with the NGOs that are already providing services in the camps to strengthen their outreach and access to, to um, those who need, them, need their services? How do we ensure victim support from the police is responsive? And finally, how do we work on access to the courts, including the virtual courts, which brings us again circularly back to the question of connectivity. So I think that we've seen, just to sum up, we have seen challenges uh, during this pandemic period. We saw extreme challenges in the first few months during the shutdown, but we've seen now that we have transitioned from that to being able to provide frontline services again. The challenges in front of us are if we can confront the issue of how to ensure access to connectivity, then we can take some of the best lessons from the rest of Bangladesh about how the adaptation has happened and bring and integrate the Rohingya community into that process. Then I think we'll be able to be providing more solutions in terms of um, access to justice for, for the Rohingya community in the camps. Uh, thank you, I'll close my remarks there. Thank you, thank you very much, Sara. It was a very comprehensive presentation. I must say, and then, uh, you know, we have had two very different uh, presentations, like Taipur pointing out that the situation in the Rohingya camp for the, is, was, was better than the rest of Bangladesh. And then, you know, like, like uh, when you come in, you, uh, may, uh, you know, your presentation pointed out that how statelessness or a refugee sit situation, it is different, you know, like how we have different kinds of rights uh, for citizens and uh, like uh, what it does to stateless people. And uh, thank you for uh, pointing out uh, that under the constitution of Bangladesh, 
uh, the Rohingyas, they do enjoy certain rights, you know, certain fundamental rights and how Im important it is to have this connectivity and how it important it is to remain connected. And I guess as the, we are facing the second wave of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, it would be, I guess, COVID-20, then let's see that, you know, if we are able to remain connected or not. But let's hope for that. But thank you for raising these points. I think these are extremely important uh, points uh, that the framework for justice needs to be there. And after all, our entire endeavor, endeavor is for the justice for the Rohingya people and, you know, for stateless and refugees all around the world. Our next uh, speaker is Asif Munir. Asif is a development uh, uh, professional a human rights activist and a cultural activist and uh, in Bangladesh. And he's also a media commentator. And he, uh, he generally uh, speaks on migration, human trafficking and refugee issues. Um, Asif would be speaking on smuggling of re uh, Rohingya refugees uh, during COVID-19. Asif, it is all yours. Thank you very much. And uh... Thanks to the moderator and uh, the distinguished panel here, and also the participants. A very good morning, afternoon, and evening to you all. Uh, let me just quickly share my presentation and then come back to you. Just a second. have the presentation just uh, it's not uh, let me just fix the screen a little bit yeah I hope you have the screen now the presentation the first opening slide yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I would use a few still images in the uh, presentation. I have less text there, but um, you know, full disclosure that some of the images are probably depressing, uh, and I have used them just to stress the point of uh, the issue here. And uh, no disrespect to the Rohingyas, and uh, I use them with uh, great respect, actually, uh, and uh, compassion for them. So um, this is just one heavy slide of uh, the text. You know, uh, when we talk about human smuggling and trafficking, sometimes, or sometimes it is termed as uh, trafficking in persons, but sometimes these are used interchangeably. What I've put in, I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but basically there are certain distinctions that um, globally accepted definitions of what human smuggling means and what uh, human trafficking means. Basic distinction is that for smuggling, it's of, of course exploitation, and there's a person or a group of persons exploiting with some kind of financial or material benefit. Whereas for trafficking in persons, I've put certain text in italics, which is threat of use of force and control of, of, over another person. So exploitation in both cases, but Smuggling is to some extent, if we, uh, it is nuanced, to some extent, whoever is in a situation of human smuggling uh, is aware of some of the dangers. Again, when you're exploiting somebody, you don't disclose, disclose everything. And that's how you get exploited because otherwise you can refuse if you know the implications. So um, for trafficking, it's, it's full force in terms of uh, actual, yeah. So, in some cases, of course, a smuggled person can become uh, in in a trafficking situation. In the first place, if you talk about Rohingyas, in especially uh, in Cox Bazar area, it started off as a human smuggling issue, uh, and because of different reasons, I'll touch upon some of them later on. So. Many of us are aware of the region, and this is where I'm focusing on, particularly in terms of human smuggling, the use of the sea route. 
So if we consider where the Rohingyas are, either in Myanmar or Bangladesh, that's where uh, the region is. And it's part of, you know, from Bangladesh, it's the Bay of Bengal and then, uh, you know, Naman Sea and uh, Indian Ocean and so forth. So whole uh, the sea route, which is used by um, human smuggling and groups or organized crime groups, smuggle out people, and taking advantage of their situation, of their vulnerability, in this case for the Rohingyas. Now, again, if we look at the migration route, I'm not looking at the global picture, but if you look at the region that we're talking about, the whole region of Southeast Asia, and both regular and irregular migration, and also human smuggling, uh, some also say smuggling of migrants. Again, if we're thinking of about Rohingyas, either they're in Myanmar, but uh, we have the experience of a large number of Rohingyas in Bangladesh and being exposed to a situation where they are taken out from Cox's Bazar area through the sea and through different points. And not all of them are very, uh, you know, very clear routes, very ambiguous and life-threatening routes. Sometimes in shanty boats, small boats crammed together and we some of us must now remember these situations years back. So with that, I go back to kind of, I've said it's like a flashback, 2015. I won't go into much detail, but I would like to compare in terms of why, uh, you know, how the situation is becoming slightly more grave, especially during the pandemic. So if you look at the flashback, uh, you know, if we flash back to that 2015, uh, many of us have seen this in the media, but also sometimes have been involved in either supporting the uh, uh, Rohingyas, and in, in this case, there were Bangladeshis also, who were trafficked, uh, or you know, situation of human smuggling. And all around the route, so it's Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, and some not even being able to go further than Bangladesh. So being, again, repatriated back, or for Bangladeshis through Myanmar. So there was a mix of Bangladeshis and Rohingya. And come to some of the images, and you probably remember all these images, so I'm not going to uh, show you too many of these, but just to stress, if you look at the people on the boats here, um, in, the, in the image on the left, um, there's of course, there's children and uh, there's mixed group, men, women, and children, and Next one is about you know, the food supplies and when they were stranded in sea and when it was an indecision by the different countries in South Asia, whether to allow these people on the boats, the shores, eventually they were. But this is again, one of the, and I've used these images from open sources. So these are available on the net. And this is again, from around that time, 2015. And many of you who have or who work with Rohingya population in Coxbudger or elsewhere, uh, you probably know in terms of uh, the attires they have, especially for women, distinct from uh, Bangladeshi women. Traditional headscarf or headwear, but also the overall dress. And I would like to put forth that these are Rohingya women. Now, how do I say that? And why do I say that? Um, apologies again, because you probably see the back of my head there in the image. I was working with one of the international agencies a few years back in 2015. And I can say with conviction that the Bangladeshis who were rescued in 2015, all were men. So if we go back to this image again, women, Rohingya women. So all those who returned, all were men. Some were boys, 15, 16 year olds. Um, and they have been repatriated through, not just through Cox's Bazar, uh, through Myanmar border, but also through um, airways from um, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. But they were all men, 100% men. Now, Fast forward, 
2020. These are in the last few months. Some in April, May, June. It's just a symbol or, a, or a, um, just as an example. But unfortunately, these situations have happened during this time of COVID-19 also. So one a group of uh, people on the boat near Malaysia and another one here in Indonesia. And again, our unfortunate events when the authorities uh, took some time on deciding whether to allow them ashore or not. And this time, it was the fear of COVID-19, the issue of stigma, that people on the boat, whether they've been tested or not, whether they are, uh, you know, carrying, uh, you know, if they're not tested, are the people on the shore in different countries exposed to COVID-19 or not? And human rights groups, international agencies came forward and requested that on humanitarian grounds, you do need to let them in. If you quarantine them, yes, do testing, but not uh, let them perish uh, just so near to your shore. And, you know, what is your responsibility? So eventually these people were able to land. And this is Bangladesh. So the point here about putting this image from 2019 is that although the government claims that um, you know, there is sort of zero tolerance on human trafficking, uh, it had reduced to, from 2016, also to, uh, to some extent in 2017, uh, when the large influx of Rohingyas uh, place in Bangladesh. Uh, so, not in the scale we have seen in 2015, but the issue of human traffickers and human smugglers being active in the region had never really stopped. Maybe they went underground for some time. Uh, the government of Bangladesh had uh, mentioned that they have a zero tolerance towards both human trafficking and drug trafficking, but uh, so far, the, you know, the organized crime groups have not been able to be you know, brought under uh, the legal jurisdiction. And then the second picture here image is from a group of people who were rescued by Bangladeshi's uh, authorities, Coast Guards. And this is the group that the Honorable Foreign Secretary was mentioning and many of you were mentioning. Uh, as far as we see from the news reports, uh, this group of people are among the group of people who were eventually taken to Bashanchar uh, for quarantine, and uh, they're still there. We heard that the authorities are thinking them, thinking to uh, bring them back to the Palang where uh, where their family members are. Now, this is the kind of uh, the main slide, and that's kind of where I focus on in terms of the challenges of human smuggling. So, as we have heard from previous speakers, the uh, although the testing has been low, but the precautions are very strong. And um, I mentioned a figure here of uh, people who have been confirmed with COVID-19, uh, for its uh, figure from October, uh, it's slightly backdated. But even then, until now, they, it hasn't had a very uh, major outbreak. And uh, I'm sure the panelists here and other colleagues would have, um, you know, much more information on that. But my point is that it's relatively contained. But what has happened, and sorry, you just mentioned that, of course, the a lot of the humanitarian actors um, have now been able to uh, work a little bit more, but over the last few months, it was very thin. And that kind of creates uh, separate sort of issues in terms of human mobility, but also the crisis factor and the risk factor. So I mentioned here is about the double jeopardy. So, uh, you know, Aminapa, you mentioned about the second wave, but also, uh, we have to see the trend that, uh, especially during the lean season, so winter season, when the sea are slightly more calm, that's when human traffickers and smugglers are more active. If we talk about the Mediterranean Sea, that's what happens. Although on turbulent waters, they also take the opportunity if people are willing to travel. But definitely for this region, if we're talking about the same period now, December, January, February, and all the way up to maybe April and May. This is a very high risk period. And this is coming from either researchers or people on the ground. And this has been seen before, that is the trend. The human smugglers are more active during the winter season because the sea is slightly more calm. 
And it's easier to convince the people. People have seen images of people drowning and they're being able to convince that, look, this is uh, now less risky. We are now entering a period, both for COVID-19, but also for human smuggling. Of course, we've heard about the escalation of conflict and people wanting to move out. And one of the options people may think that, okay, if I can uh, go to another country, uh, and one of the reasons probably is that the tensions between the Bangladeshis and Rohingyas are slightly increasing. Uh, and also difficulty of monitoring the law and order situation. I mean, putting up fence is fine, uh, but you know, human traffickers and smuggling groups or groups of organized crime they wouldn't cut the wires and enter. They would uh, enter through different entry points in and around the camp. Uh, and my guess is that they can still be active unless there are sort of the spread of the law enforcing agencies or even volunteers, or even whether CCTV systems or you know more surveillance mechanisms are put in place. Um, hardwire is of course one thing. And of course there are in reinforcement of law enforcing agencies. In terms of human trafficking and smuggling, not enough. Uh, of course, the uncertainty of repatriation. And then the issue of uh, stigma about the, uh, the Rohingyas, that you know, they, they can be, you know, they, they are the people probably responsible or can be responsible in spreading um, the, the, the COVID-19, the, the virus. And in terms of those who are traveling and being rescued, whether to let them in or not. And that's probably one of the reasons why a group who have been rescued are still in Bhashan Um Last two points, the internal and transnational organized groups are well organized and active. And at the same time, the uh, regional mechanisms, I've just uh, given one example here. Bali process is an uh, intergovernmental uh, network of uh, you know, countries looking at or addressing human trafficking. But uh, since 2015, they've talked about reinforcing and working together. Nothing much has happened. So, uh, you know, whether there are actually solutions within the challenges here, move, end with a new dimension is that beyond the Southeast Asia is Australia. And that's again, you know, again, not just a stigma, but it's also uh, some kind of xenophobia also. I've taken this image from the internet. It's about a, a video from the Australian government discouraging uh, people to use sea routes, of course, for irregular migration, not the regular migration. Uh, I've, I haven't actually seen the video, but there. Uh, and again, I come back to the sort of the map uh, that if you look at the bottom, because if people are actually able to travel, uh, and survive the ordeal uh, through the help of unscrupulous human smugglers, whether they can actually land up in Australia or not. And uh, many of us who have worked with different agencies so that uh, the Australian government, I don't know if there are uh, friends and colleagues here who are from Australia or who uh, live there, you can clarify if I'm wrong. What I've heard is there is some kind of uh, Worry sometimes that the irregular uh, channels uh, would be used or can be used for human smugglers to take people to uh, Australia. This is just the last slide. Um, I was just watching this television drama. It's about uh, the detention camps in Australia. And the image on the right is about an Afghan family. Of course, they, they're actors, but they traveled by boat uh, from Afghanistan in fear of the Taliban. And the man lost his wife and child, the youngest child. Heartbreaking story. Uh, this year they have won uh, you know, television awards by ABC. But I just wanted to put it forward that again, not just Southeast Asia, the concern and, and the sort of the trend goes beyond the Southeast Asian region. With that, I end what I have. I went beyond time, I think. Uh, apologies for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Asif. Uh, but thank you, uh, Amin, uh, for pointing this out that we are facing a situation of double jeopardy where not only COVID might be coming, but also human smuggling. 
So, the, you know, there is a political economy of uh, refugeehood. We are well aware of it and the securitization of the issues and the security dimension of it. Uh, because of a uh, paucity of time, maybe I'll just quickly move over to our final speaker, Dr. Meghna Guha Thakurta. And uh, after Meghna speaks, uh, maybe we can take uh, 15 minutes extra from the lunch break uh, that uh, Bias mentioned earlier, which will be our dinner break. Um, and um, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Meghna Guha Thakurta. Uh, she is a former professor of the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Currently, she is the executive director of research initiatives, Bangladesh. And uh, she is also a former member of the National Human Rights Commission, Bangladesh, and is currently advisor to the International Chittagong Hill Trust Commission. Meghna writes uh, extensively on minority, refugee, and gender issues. And uh, her organization, Research Initiatives Bangladesh, has been involved with the Rohingya issue uh, for a long time. And uh, Meghna will be speaking on facing COVID-19, Rohingyas and the host community. Uh, and Meghna, it is all yours. Thank you very much, Amina. Um, I'm also going to try to be very brief because of the uh, lack of time, uh, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. I like, I prefer question and answer sessions more to lectures. So uh, here goes. Um, anyway, I think um, basically a, a lot has been said about stigmatization and refugees. Um, uh, and we have also seen that happening in, in terms times of COVID, where migrants uh, as such are quite um, uh, discriminated against in terms and stigmatized because of being carriers of germs. So very interestingly, um, although the Rohingyas were stigmatized, and, uh, and very interestingly, both in terms of the Bangladesh side, hosts, governments, as well as the Myanmar side. So even in Myanmar, uh, they were, uh, and through some conversations with people living in Myanmar, they were telling us that the government of Myanmar thought Rohingyas were carriers of COVID-19 and therefore return repatriation is not a doable thing right at this moment. So, um, and in Bangladesh too, um, they were, uh, and I think our foreign uh, um, secretary also um, told us that there was consternation about the fact that there will be massive, uh, massive kind of spread uh, in the camps. Um, very interestingly, um, uh, they, uh, I found in some of my studies that some of the NGOs who were in charge of site management in the camp were asked to actually extend the graveyards. Um, very, very um, quite scary. But unlike many other uh, speakers have said, nothing that, um, uh, you know, and some numbers have been given. So we were happy that the outbreak was not as strong as it was feared and that um, much of the, um, the, the community could uh, had the resilience to face the, uh, the COVID. Um, and, um, but there were certain differences between, uh, and, and one of the reasons which many reasons have been pointed out for that, the good offices, the good institutional mechan mechanisms of the health sector, etc. I don't know enough about that, but I do know that in the intersectoral coordination body, uh, there were a lot of uh, international expertise present who were from Southeast Asia, who had faced SARS and uh, also had faced Ebola in Africa. So the, um, the presence of this health uh, expertise did have and could inform the, um, and of course we had the UN agencies who were abiding by the WHO principles from the very beginning of the uh, situation. So you, you did have that kind of a mechanism uh, which informed the administration. And I think it did play a part because, um, uh, and now I'm going to, uh, we ourselves, RIB has a project in that area which is actually looking at uh, the 
how the Rohingya influx is, uh, is affecting the host community, but we also work with Rohingyas through our participatory action research. And we try to get both perspectives and, uh, try, and the whole, and it's been, uh, the project's been going for a year. And we have, uh, I think, uh, trying to address the tensions that there, and many people asked questions about it in the last uh, session, that the tensions between the host community and the refugees and uh, how to address this or to how to mitigate the tensions. Um, so uh, from there, we, because we were present at, on the scene, we decided to, uh, we weren't allowed to go into the camps because we weren't an essential service or a critical service. Uh, but uh, so therefore, uh, we tried to do some phone in interviews with the people we were working with and try to understand from their perspectives, both Rohingyas and the host community, how they faced COVID-19. Um, among the Rohingyas, they said that food, shelter, gas, water supply, which were considered to be essential uh, supplies were not a problem. They continued to receive those as before, the same amount of food as before. So that was not a problem. Um, but education of children, they were, uh, whatever little education they were getting, the schools were stopped. Therefore, the children were uh, more or less, uh, uh, you know, uh, not uh, going uh, in habituating themselves to going to school anymore. Uh, and then the construction works were, were stopped. Uh, infrastructure was closed. Uh, and that affected some of the um, uh, the cash, uh, the cash, uh, you know, cash for work um, source uh, that sometimes Rohingyas were given uh, by working as volunteers. They were given at least a limited amount of cash, and that helped them to tied by their emergency situation sometimes. So that was stopped, and they they did feel the difference. And um, <clears throat> so there were intermittent inspection by officials, uh, but not as much. Sara had already said that how, and I learned from her at that time, how the legal aid workers were not considered to be a critical service or an essential service and not allowed um, to go into the camps uh, unless it was, of course, that she mentioned UNHCR, um, uh, protected and so they were um so there was an um uh, a problem of uh, oversight so most of the violence against women cases were being tried by the local community leaders the machis the um or rohingya community leaders and there was a lack of oversight by ngos which normally would have been there um <clears throat> So, uh, and of course, masks were distributed and, and uh, but even then, although, and we do work in, uh, you know, it's a vast expanse, the whole, the whole Rohingya shelters, the campsites are acres and acres, in, as you've seen in pictures. So, uh, on one hand, you can have a very different picture. On the other hand, if you go to a much more remote area that is more, uh, less access, that is less accessible than the ones you're used to by the roadside, uh, then you will have to be facing, and many of us work there. We did, we did meet with um, some kind of um, response that they did not uh, get masks from everyone, only certain NGOs were giving masks, and so it wasn't ready at hand. Uh, <clears throat> so this was from the Rohingyas, and from the hosts, it's a totally different kind of a story, where mobility was, of course, in the camps too, the mobility was restricted, the, especially when the case of certain um, cases arose in the Okia, in the local districts, uh, they closed down the entry to camps. Um, but of course, uh, the refugees they told us that they could uh, walk within a certain uh, uh, periphery uh, and visit others, but not, uh, not to go very far, and especially not to take highways or roads. 
Um, in the host community also, the mobility was restricted, but they were far more affected by this restriction of mobility than they were by COVID because uh, uh, there, is, uh, there were check posts on every corner, especially on the road to that you go to the market. So there were times when uh, the host community said that we were only allowed to go once a day to the market place. And if they saw us from uh, going to and fro, uh, they would, we would be stopped and asked questions. What happened to the health system? Very interestingly, and it's also true normally uh, in rural areas or in, in, in uh, sort of uh, uh, remote areas, uh, the most accessible health point for any resident of this country is the pharmacy. Uh, the compounder of the pharmacy will suggest a medicine and you will get it. So it's quite normal to, uh, to know this, but in the in the times of COVID, they were uh, they did not go all the way because sometimes it is impossible to take a long hike into the nearest health planning uh, center. So they would have to they went to the pharmacy for some suggestions for aspirins or whatever that was suggested to them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, often they said autos and and we work with uh, the very lower income bracket of the host community, those who did not benefit at all by the, um, the normal uh, sort of uh, camp regime, you could say those who worked in the camp and, and those who students who would be taken as volunteers in these US, UN agencies. So they did not have that privilege. They were butchers, they were rickshaw pullers, they were vendors. And, and for them, uh, the market was very important. And uh, so it, and the, mar and the very uh, access to market was stopped. So that was a big issue for them. Livelihood was drastically affected. And usually in Bangladesh, when such a disaster happens, whether it's natural disaster or humanitarian, there's a drought, for example, and automatically there would be, you would be susceptible, uh, you would be, ten you would tend to borrow from your neighbors or from relatively richer, uh, relatives. And so, but this did not happen in the COVID system because everyone was affected. Even the shopkeeper whom you would often go for to buy things on credit uh, would not be able to give it because there's no food on his table. And so, so these, are, these are situations which draw us to the differences in, in humanitarian disasters like this, humani double humanitarian disasters, one from a, a, a district affected by a refugee situation and second by an ep epidemic or a pandemic. And, uh, and no such uh, kind of uh, vision was ever, um, you know, uh, uh, was ever taken up in how to, uh, even in, the, in a disc risk, um, um, sorry, disaster risk management policy that Bangladesh is very proud to having, there was no such element there, how to, uh, you know, uh, deal with it. Um, so uh, relief packets, re packages that was offered by the government, very uh, few people that we know of um, or whom we asked knew about them. So they heard about one or two people who got it, but most of them did not. Uh, and then generally their opinion was that it was not well coordinated. Uh, and they always said that in the camps, everything is well coordinated, but in the administ local administration, nothing like this is very well co coordinated. And there was an absence of information. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, basically I'll end here and I can go on to more asking, answering more questions in fact, uh, is uh, that I, we thought that some of the recommendations that came up from them was that violence against women should be looked at as a critical service in every disaster situation. Um, then there should be better coordination of relief in the host community. Uh, a mechanism was not worked out at the local level as it should have been. There was more knowledge should be available to services by citizens. Uh, uh, should be accessed by citizens about knowledge of how to get access relief, access medical help, etc. 
And um, a lot was said about social cohesion in the last session. So basically, uh, I look at it from the more positive aspect that the if social cohesion is a is um, the presence of social cohesion uh, is often something that contributes to resilience in during the disaster um, situation. And if that is so, then the centrality of the ethics of care constitutes, uh, you know, a prime, uh, uh, um, definitely one of the most prominent aspects that we should be looking into, uh, into any kind of reviewing of the existing disaster management situations that we do have. Uh, the competition in the market is important because there uh, you are competing with other sellers, buyers, refugee versus host community. Um, so uh, the absence of the market also is another uh, kind of a situation that we had uh, to deal with. Uh, there was hardly any, you know, one, one of the things, yes, the prices rose high where there was a market, but where the daily uh, buying and selling was totally absent because of the lack of transportation uh, was another problem. And many, unlike many uh, disaster situations, the um, our people often the first uh, step that they take is um, starvation. They they instead of taking two meals a day, just have one meal a day. They and that is this situation that we also felt when faced. Uh, in the host community. And in talking about cohesion, I also think that we should be, I'm just making a general point here, um, but that gender and diversity should also be part of that cohesion. So you cannot have social cohesion uh, of, uh, uh, with, with just one principle. You should look at age, you should look at gender, and you should look at cultural diversities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Meghna. That was a very exhaustive, I must say, very exhaustive presentation. You brought in the host community perspective as well. And um, before we, op uh, you know, like we open up the uh, floor, I would say for discussion, if we can have uh, 10 to 15 minutes of discussion and question answers. I would say, you know, like when you pointed out uh, violence against women that came out also through uh, Sarah's presentation and education, that was also Sarah mentioned that online education, I mean, these should be considered as uh, essential services. Uh, so when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 on, uh, on the refugee situation, refugee situation, I think it is through a right framework that one needs to look into it. But now we'll uh, open up, uh, uh, open the floor up for the, a discussion and question answer. Atik or Bias, if you, whoever would volunteer, if there are questions and some observations in the chat box. Atik, yes. are you there? Yes, please. Um, yes, I can read out some questions. Yes, please. We got, we got seven questions. The first one from Laboni Khatun. Why there is still lack of spatial policy for the Rohingya people in Bangladesh? That's the question. Lack of spatial policy. The second question is from Anisullah. What percentage of COVID-19 inside the camps compared to host communities? A question to Dr. Taifur Rahman. The next question is, from Shapon Adnan. Do the informal dispute resolution mechanisms in the Rohingya camps differ from the traditional Shalish bench in Bangladesh? And if so, how? In what ways? Andre Powell is about, my question is on how are Rohingya organizing to face the COVID-19 risk? Next question is, should not UNESCO be active to disambuse Bangladeshis that Rohingya COVID carries? Should they not be encouraged to mount campaign to lessen any such stigma? What about the UN TV channel to make honest documentary which could be shown in appropriate language in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Myanmar? So these are the some quick questions. The last one is from 
taken. Today is celebrated as the International Day, which would living with disabilities. What cha challenges does this persons, probably the Rohingyas who live with disabilities and how is Taka helping them out? So these are, the last question is from Malik. Madam, do you fear, uh, I can't read it, uh, uh, genocide? I'm not sure. These are the, some questions. So yeah, wide mix of audience and yeah, different types of questions. Yes, you can sum it up and quickly uh, answer them. We are getting more questions, so I will come back to them later. Thank you. So, uh, like, uh, if we can go the, you know, like uh, there there are specific questions to Typhoon, uh, to um, Sarah and Sarah, uh, Sarah. Make Sarah. Sarah. And then, uh, Meghna, if you can take up the genocide question and ask it, if you can also respond to the other questions. And Sarah, what was the genocide question? Could you repeat it, please? Uh, you see, uh, genocide. The genocide question, what was it? Uh, by suppose that you see a uh -huh. genocide uh, happening or it's, gain it's or a fear a subaltern genocide in Bangladesh. I don't know yeah. what it says. It just says, Madam, do you fear yeah. a subaltern genocide? Uh, I mean, this question was not written properly and we can but, keep it. Okay. We can just keep it. I mean, maybe they are thinking that, you know, is it going to be a situation where, uh, you know, uh, like gross violations of rights or something, maybe something like that, you know, it might come to that. Do you fear a subaltern I, genocide? Okay. Okay. okay, I get Sarah, it. Okay. Uh, Sarah, you can start take... off with the health. No, uh, no, if Sarah can start off with that, uh, she had two specific questions on the. Uh, yes, sure. So one question is from uh, Shopunat, Dr. Shopunat Nan about Shalish and whether it's the same in the Rohingya communities as in the Bangladeshi context. Um, I, I think. I think there are some important differences probably, uh, differences in practice. One is in terms of the kind of law that's being applied because um, neither of the forms of Shalish necessarily apply what is statutory law in Bangladesh, but more an understanding of what the legal norms are. Um, <clears throat> and that understanding will may be different for the Rohingyas. So I think that process is different. And I think the way the, even the traditional Shalish in Bangladesh has been quite, has, has I guess, um, changed quite a bit because of its interaction with various interventions by NGOs and others. Uh, I don't know that the Rohingya uh, internal community dispute resolution has changed as much, but it seems to me it's a very good question in terms of something that needs to be studied more. Um, because it, in, in the Bangladesh context, at least the traditional Shalish was adapted by many to provide a, a, a acceptable dispute resolution process, but which was one that operated more within the frame of a fairer structure, uh, applying national laws and trying to ensure that, for example, women were more involved in the process um, and that they had more voice. So if, if we were to learn more about what the Rohingya community dispute resolution is, then that could, it could follow a similar kind of path, I think. Um, the other question that seems to me for me is about the question about disabilities. And the question is, what is how is Dhaka working on issues around people with the rights of people with disabilities? Um, there are some uh, major organizations, Bangladeshi organizations, such as the Center for um, Development and Disabilities, which are working very much in the camps. But in terms of Bangladesh in general, the, uh, there's a legislation on the rights of people with disabilities. Um, so other legislation as well is for setting up a neurodevelopmental disability foundation. Um, so there are a number of initiatives in place in terms of the law and of course some policy commitments as well. Um, I don't know enough about how much <coughs> is being done in relation to protection around disability rights in the Rohingya camps themselves. But again, it's a very important point that, um, that needs uh, greater, greater attention as well. I'll leave it there, Minapa. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay. Uh, yes, um, 
actually uh, for host committee the whole process i have some uh, information about the full uh, on a full host committee uh, um, covid related information uh, that was uh, cumulative after week 47 uh, tested uh, 42388 and confirmed case was uh, 5180 death uh, 73 in isolation right now uh, 229 and recovered 4878 in quarantine for, uh, 14987 and total current isolation and treatment bed occupied capacity 90 and uh, this is uh, for host population of Cox's Bazar. And uh, here, all uh, uh, all the sub district of Cox's Bazar together, uh, uh, cumulative report is there. Thank you. I think we'll move uh, move move on because the question, uh, you know, I thought uh, it was important to address that question because I think the person might be referring uh, to like uh, about if they, uh, one is forcing a tension or a conflict-like situation uh, between the host community and the uh, yeah, refuge, uh, you know, Rohingyas. That's why I said that, Meghna, if you can um, No, I think, um, I think there are several questions to that effect. So I'll try to just um, um, bring them together. Um, so, uh, of course, that will depend on my reading of the question, and rather than the question itself, so they might have there might be differences. Um, I think uh, uh, Leslie, someone called G. Leslie, has uh, mentioned several things about full citizenship, and uh, and also why we are why countries like Malaysia, Bangladesh is not giving full refugee status to the um, to the Rohingyas. Uh, good question. Uh, definitely my question as well. Um, but um, but we know that um, uh, for Bangladesh, uh, for a long time, in fact, they had not even opened borders for the Rohingyas formally. It's only in the 2017 that when masses, there was a massive influx in so short a time that they, they opened the borders, they had to. Uh, but um, uh, I think uh, some of the countries do have have given them livelihood status. You said that they are not allowed to work, but some of them have given them a card through which they, like Malaysia and uh, India, but even then formally, um, they're not allowed to work or, uh, you know, they're only uh, receiving rations uh, for that. Um, and why doesn't ASEAN or the others you've raised that? There's a lot. And of course, then you go from the humanitarian side back into politics, uh, which is uh, how does um, uh, how does actually uh, the how people um, how ASEAN, for example, is divided. Unfortunately, uh, they uh, there are people Indonesia, Malaysia who tries to put us pressure on it, but then there are others like Cambodia, Laos, who does not want to meddle with Myanmar or put pressure on Myanmar. And they do share, and unfortunately enough, many people in the region do share the Myanmar uh, narrative of Rohingyas being Bengalis or uh, Bengalis and uh, not belonging to Myanmar. So this is a is at the root uh, of the whole question of citizenship and how one interprets, hi interprets history. And again, we go back to the first session where the question of pressure uh, and how far uh, people are willing to put pressure and how far even a country like China is willing to put pressure at all in uh, with Myanmar. And then the economics and the uh, politics just has to uh, sort of, um, are, are you know, confronting each other and uh, one has to deal with that in very high level politics, which none of us seem to be doing. Um, so again, it's an international relations question, not necessarily, our session was on COVID. So I think um, uh, that's 
perhaps why we didn't want to touch on it um, because it's too broad a question. About subaltern genocide, I, I don't think, Mina, that it's about uh, the host versus the, the uh, refugee community. I think subaltern, the definition of subaltern is, as my understanding, is about anything who is uh, a subaltern that is uh, sub, you, you know, who is not the dominant force in society. Um, and although I would say that refugees um, are uh, definitely not the dominant force in our in in the areas that they reside in, but I would say that the people we work with, as I said, with uh, with uh, butchers, with uh, vendors, with rickshaw pullers, they're also not the dominant forces in their society. So I don't know whether they where they that person calls it, but genocide, you know, there's a specific um, definition to genocide, which I'm not going to go into here, but it does not fit that, uh, that definition does not fit here because interestingly, the region in which Ukiah and Tekna, where the refugee situation is, is actually a very multicultural society. There are, they are Rakhine people there, they are indigenous people there, uh, and they are, um, you know, um, Hindus and Buddhists and Christians there living there as citizens of Bangladesh. And um, so, and I, in, in fact, very interestingly, I have to just, and I'll end with just this instance or example, where I met a, a Tanjangia girl, this is a tribal girl, you could say uh, tribal or indigenous, uh, who uh, works in the camps with the Rohingyas. And I asked her that, and they have similar features like the Rakhine. So I asked her whether she was at all, you know, accosted by the Rohingyas and distrusted or, or they were uh, aggressive about it. And she said, yes, initially they were. They said, do you come from the Rakhine? And, and she said, but then I answered that, no, I've never been to the Rakhines. I've never been across the border. I am from this country. And... Uh, but I speak the same language as you do. That is the Rohingya language is very close to the Chittagonian dialect or at least 70% of it. So uh, so they, she speaks that language being in, in that area. And that brought in a com commonality and a trust. So very interesting, the language question and the ethnic question and the identity question within a kind of a multiverse, uh, you know, kind of a, a system, uh, how does the identity come through? Uh, lots of questions that we can ask, but I'm, it's not a space to go into. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, so I think we are pretty much running out of time. If there are... Uh, yes, I think we should give our attendees at least half an hour for lunch or dinner okay. break because but, the next uh, session starts yes. in 30 minutes. Yes, I'm, uh, but if Asif would like to just uh, say something in, in a couple of minutes. Yes, uh, take five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Thank you. I'll be quick. I think on based on some of the comments, very overall few points. Uh, someone mentioned about, Leslie, you mentioned about uh, why there is no policy. I think uh, particularly for the Rohingya issue government, Bangladesh government has a policy. Uh, it has had for some time. But with an evolving situation, it's difficult to stick to a particular line uh, with evolving situation. The policy keeps evolving. But uh, as far as we understand, a lot of the policy um, initiatives are still confidential in the sense that it's not very public knowledge. Uh, the, from the government side, uh, they have sometimes and they do sometimes share with others. And whenever that is the case, we collaborate or we sort of provide our suggestion. So I would say that there is a policy and even, you know, the situation of uh, the uh, move towards Bhashanchar today or tomorrow, it's part of that policy. Um, and just one more comment about, you mentioned about the use of the media. I'm sure, especially in terms of dealing with stigma. So I'm sure a lot of the organizations who are working in the field uh, Start from NGOs, both national and international, UN agencies. There are different mechanisms to deal with the stigma. I'm not sure, particularly for the COVID-19, stigma around COVID-19, how much the agencies have been able to work on that. Because, again, the field operations were very limited. 
I suppose now, uh, if there are still that issue that can be worked on, I just want to add one point that I noticed that particularly the Bangladeshi media, whether, I mean, mainly the television media, it's very anti-Rohingya and very demonizing and one-sided. Generally, I see sometimes exceptions and some of us Bangladeshis here are commentators on local media as well. And we have to fight with the journalists and the angles they put that it's all their fault. Everything is their fault. Whatever happens in Cox's Bazaar or in order, everything is their fault. So there's quite a lot of generalizing and a very one-sided view by the local media. So some kind of media education is probably required. Stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It had been a I must say a very exhaustive and a very comprehensive session. We have had uh, four presentations on different dimensions of the uh, situation in the camps and outside the camp in Cox's Bazaar during the COVID-19 period. And since uh, we do not have much time, I'll just wind up by saying that, uh, uh, you know, like, I think uh, from the presentations, what came out very importantly for me at least, was how, how does one define essential services? I mean, this is very important because we have seen that, you know, about violence of women, uh, issues on connectivity, it, it is important. Connectivity is important for the mental wellness or mental well-being or psychological well-being of uh, human beings. So that thing, and we have experienced it through the uh, COVID-19 situation that how important this connectivity has been. So, you know, this essential services, I think at the policy level, you know, uh, one can make interventions. I think this panel would be able to make some interventions uh, about uh, essential services and uh, that legal services are important because when it comes to violence against women and also, you know, like uh, people with disabilities, today we are celebrating the International Day of People with Disabilities or people with special needs. So these are important questions that have come out. Also smuggling, you know, that is something that one needs to uh, look into because uh, it is something one is doing with consent. One is aware of, as you mentioned, Asif. So if, if one is aware of, so one has to look at the political economy side of it. And uh, I would say that, you know, like conclude by saying that if there are, uh, you know, like maybe there are concerns that, uh, because of the ongoing uh, or, uh, nature of this crisis and also because of the ongoing na nature of, of COVID-19. And now that we are uh, predicted to go into the second wave and we are experiencing it, Bangladesh is experiencing a um, you know, spike in it. So if there would be more tension or more violence, that I would say that uh, you know, our foreign secretary did mention that Bangladesh is, uh, you know, very cognizant of the rights situation and the security situation uh, are in and around the camps. So I guess that is not something that I see as coming. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude and uh, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. Thank you very much to the organizers. My apologies for uh, shooting over time. And my apologies to the persons, you know, from whom we could not take the questions. I could see many hands rising, but I'm afraid uh, that we had have to cut short. And uh, thank you very much. Bye, sir. So over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Amina Mohsin and all the panelists on the COVID-19 session. It was really interactive and interesting. And now we will go for... 30 minutes lunch or dinner break or if you want to stress your legs or you know take some rest and we'll be back exactly at 1 30 p.m gmt or exactly 27 minutes from now onwards i'm going to stop the live streaming now but i would request our attendees not to log out uh, just unmute yourself or stop your video but be back after 30 minutes and thank you everyone see you shortly thanks